Good day again to you who are going to listen to this uh, series. Uh, this is the third in our series about the Godhead. And today we're going to talk about God, the Holy Spirit. Now I know the term immediately grates some of you if you listen to this, but uh, I would again ask you to open your hearts, soften your hearts, and open your minds and get rid of your preconceived ideas and listen to what scripture says. Let's just close our eyes before we start. Our dear Father in heaven, we're going to talk about something that is very dear to our hearts. Some of us don't agree with what the church teaches about the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you to take away all animosity in those who are for and those who are against. Help us to listen with hearts that are really open to your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there is a, a, a great problem uh, and I need to be a little bit technical today, so please bear with me uh, for two reasons. Um, I hear many of my friends saying, my anti-Trinitarian friends saying to me that the Trinity is a uh, Catholic concept. Now, you know, you will have to ask yourself, when did the Catholic Church start to be the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church? Because what you actually mean is that, is that the, the Trinity is a Roman Catholic invention. Is that true? We have to look at that. And then there are two parts of scripture that are attacked. The first part is uh, 1 John 5 verse 7. There are three that, uh, that witness, three witnesses. Now, whether that verse should be in the Bible or not is not going to be the discussion today. But the second verse that is attacked is Matthew 28 verse 19 to 20 actually verse 18 to 20 the great commission and especially verse 19 people say verse 19 should not be in the Bible now it is absolutely foundational and you'll see as we go along to our understanding although even without uh, Matthew 28 verse 19, I can still uh, prove to you that Jesus, uh, sorry, that the Holy Spirit is God and that he's part, he's part of the Godhead. But it's going to be much more difficult. So let's start and read Matthew 28 verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Now, as I said, there's a movement, a strong movement, and not just from the anti trinitarian camp, but there's also a movement from uh, liberal scholarship who don't want to uh, accept the Bible as the inspired word of God. We, we know them sometimes as higher criticism. They want to get rid of the Holy Spirit and they want to get rid of this verse. And they base it on Eusebius, who lived, who was born in around about 263 AD and he died around about 339 AD. He lived mostly before the Council of Nicaea, May to August 325 AD. Now, people who say that this is a Catholic invention say that with Nicaea, the Trinitarian doctrine 
was brought into the church. And I've read documents and books and I've listened to presentations about this and giving the facts and the figures and so on. So we're not going to go into detail with that. I'm going to look at the, at the, at the basic, basic assumption that this verse does not belong in the Bible. And that the idea of the Trinity uh, does not belong in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity doesn't come into the Bible, that's true. But the word got it, yes, we do get it. And we know from Scripture that Jesus and the Father are two persons, but it's one God. They are one God. We saw that from the scripture. Now I'm going to, we're going to investigate. Does the Bible allow us to say that um, the Holy Spirit is also part of the Godhead as a third person? Again, let's just look at it and look at the evidence. But we start with this verse. People who say this verse doesn't belong in the Bible, start with Eusebius. And they say Eusebius is their reason for that. In his textual criticism of the New Testament, Connie Bear writes, it is clear, therefore, that the manuscripts which Eusebius inherited from his predecessor, Pamphilius, of Pamphilus, at Caesarea in Palestine, some at least preserved the original reading. So they say Eusebius got some of his manuscripts from Pamphilus at Caesarea in Palestine. And Pamphilus manuscripts, the, the manuscripts that he got from Pamphilus doesn't have 28.19, especially verse 19, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have it. So they say, these manuscripts didn't contain it. And that's why Eusebius, when he quotes Matthew 28 verse 19, doesn't quote this part. He only uses the summary statement, baptized in the name of Jesus. So we have to look at this, and ask ourselves the question, is this true? Well, in the first place, the, we don't have these so-called manuscripts. Then he says, it had been conjectured. It had been conjectured. <laughs> and it is conjectured by Dr. Davis Davidson, Dr. Martineau, by the Dean of Westminster, by Prof. Harnock, to mention but a few names out of many. So he says it had been conjectured, and then he give all these great names. Listen, they are great scholars, all of them. But it doesn't make it true. It had been conjectured. And they are being driven by a basic philosophy, same philosophy, most of them, that bring them to this conclusion. So like I want to contend with you today, they are being led by their preconceived ideas. Don't allow your preconceived ideas to, uh, to make you interpret scripture the way you want to interpret it. Allow scripture to speak for itself. So, and also history. They say, they conjectured that here the received text could not contain the very words of Jesus. These words of Jesus, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, could not have been in the received text. But it's been conjectured. And I'll show you why that is a little bit, I, I can't go along with that. So this was David Ignatius, and he used Eusebius. And he says, in Eusebius there's no mention of the Godhead of the Trinity, no mention uh, of God the Holy Spirit, God the Father and God the Son. Is this true? Well, if you read the original in Eusebius, 
and I did. Uh, you'll see that he does mention God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just a little, I think, uh, a couple of hundred words later, you read that. But they ignore it. So there is an allusion in, in Eusebius to the Trinity. So even though he does not quote verbatim, verse 19, they, you know, it's, it's debatable. It's not so sure that he had manuscripts that did not contain those words. And it's all conjecture. Now, Origen, born a little bit before uh, Eusebius, 185 to, and he died at uh, 254, he elu alludes very clearly to verse 19. Not a direct quote, but he alludes to it. He clearly details the Christian belief that includes the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and even places them in that very same order of precedence. In other words, he might just have had the original text in front of him, with verse 19 there. Origen's first three points in De Principius move in a progressive and systematic fashion nearly identical to the modern articulation of the Trinitarian doctrine. Now, he's a little bit before the Council of Nicaea. So now I ask you, was Origen Catholic? Some people would say a Roman Catholic. Well, they will be wrong, technically. They will be wrong, technically. Uh, as you, can we say this is Catholic doctrine already? Or is it just Catholic or general church, early church? By the way, this Mark Hansen's book, Tracing the Threat of Trinitarian Thoughts from Ignatius to Origen, is excellent. Excellent reading material. Right, so now we look at Tertullian, was born 155 and he died 240. So he said just a little bit before Origen. And he has a direct quotation. He quotes verse 19 directly. On his departure to the Father, Jesus told the disciples to go and teach all nations who were to be baptized into the Father and into the Son and into the Holy Ghost. So that's a direct quotation. A little bit uh, change here and there, but it's a quote, you can see it's a quotation from verse 19. And this is in his book Against Heretics. Then we uh, go even earlier. Clement of Alexandria, born 150 AD, died 193 AD. He alludes, it's a clear allusion to it. Christians are protected as it is by the power of God the Father and the blood of God the Son and the dew of the Holy Spirit. His use of the term dew could possibly allude to Christ's illustration of baptism by the Spirit in Acts 1 verse 5. That's also Mark Hansen. And um, if you read uh, Clement, it's not very easy to read him, but if you read him, you can see what he says and what he means. Then even before him, we have Irenaeus, born 120 or 140 and died 200 to 203. He also has a direct quotation from verse 19. And again, giving to the, uh, to the disciples the power of regeneration into God, he said to them, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, also a direct quotation. Now, you need to understand, these are early church fathers. This, you cannot say Irenaeus was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic. And he has the same idea that the men before him had, or after him. So to say this is a Catholic invention is a bit far-fetched. Now, even before Irenaeus, we have Justin Martyr. 100 to 165 AD. He also alludes to it. Bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he taking them gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and offers thanks. And we know that he quotes from another source which I could not get my hands on, which is even earlier. Uh, a Gnostic source. It is uh, nevertheless 
a Gnostic source, but including this statement. So I ask again, can you say it is a Roman Catholic invention? Again, I don't think that is very responsible to have that position because we, it just doesn't bear out in scrutiny. Right, then, very early source, Ignatius of Antioch, born around about 35 AD and he died around about 107 AD. He was a contemporary of John and the, in the, and the disciples. He was a contemporary, very early, definitely not Roman Catholic. And he quotes a direct quotation until he come for whom it is reserved and he shall be the expectation of the Gentiles hath been fulfilled in the gospel. Our Lord saying that I entered in because uh, the Greek is difficult there. Go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All then are good together. No, you can read it for yourself. The epistle to the Philadelphians. Epistle of Ignatius to the Philadelphians. Mm -hmm. The exact date is very difficult, but we can see when he died and when he was born. Some date this letter around about 70 AD. Even earlier. Before the temple was destroyed, in any case. Very early source. Definitely not Roman Catholic. And he quotes this. Now remember, I listened. I was part of the discussion and I listened. For many hours I didn't say a thing. I just listened to what anti-Trinitarians say. And they say, this verse, this verse 19, was created and sculpted according to the theology of the Trinitarian theology and it was inserted into the Bible around about 325 with the Council of Nicaea. Just looking at this, it's impossible. It's impossible. Now, Ignatius also speaks about the divinity of Christ and I had to laugh when I read this. He says, he viewed the Father as the one true God, okay? In the same vein, he also stated that whoever declares that there is but one God, only so as to take away the divinity of Christ, is a devil. In other words, they had the same crisis. There were people in the time of Jesus, in the time of the apostles uh, rather, who did not want to accept the divinity of Christ. This was a bone of contention from the beginning. Satan was at work from the beginning to get rid of the divinity of Christ. And I mean divinity, he means by divinity, 100% divinity, because he says to take away from the divinity of Christ. You cannot, you cannot be God if you're not 100% God. That is a principle. And I'll show you as we go along. Now, the next source is the Didache, or the Didache, as the Americans would pronounce it. Now, this document is an amazing document. It's an amazing document. Definitely, if you look at the contents before 70 AD, it had to be written before 70 AD. Because if you read through uh, the Didache, which means the teaching, Didache means the teaching. And we get our English word from that didactics, how to teach. And it was the, basically the earliest church manual that we have access to. An amazing document. And there are only a handful of scholars, about 12 of them worldwide, who really studied this. And the consensus of these scholars today is that this document cannot be older than 100 AD. But most of them dated before, before 70 AD, before the end of the temple or the destruction of the, of the temple, the second temple. And the reason for that is the language and the events they refer to in, in this document was pre-70. The temple was still there. Now, there are two direct quotations. Chapter 7 of the Didache says, 
concerning baptism, baptized this way, having first taught all these things. This is important. They read Matthew 28 verse 19 or 18 to 20 and the writer or the writers of this document came to the conclusion that from the instruction they gave, got from the letter of Matthew, that they should, the Gospel of Matthew, that they should first teach the converts to Christianity, everything, and then they can baptize them. Now that's interesting. Only that one, uh, show, that one uh, fact shows us that, they, that the Matthew 28 verse 19 had to be written before that. And I'll show you why. First teaching these things, baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In living water, that means running water. But if you had no living water and no running water, baptize into other water, standing water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, so they wanted to do it in cold water, and they had to, they had to fast before they were baptized. That was interesting. Cold water, baptized into, uh, in warm water. Okay? But, older people and people that couldn't do that, that they were sick, but if you have n neither, pour out water three times upon the head into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There again he quotes it. So if you're in the desert, you don't have running water, you don't have enough water, but you only have a bucket of water, then pour it over the head. That's an early document. And interesting, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now this distinct uh, indication of every, every uh, person indicates to us that they were seen separately. That is just Greek grammar. Having first taught all these things. Let's have a look at Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20 to see why it is quoted in this way. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So I have the authority on the strength of the fact that he was uh, anointed on the strength of the fact that he arose from the dead, he got the authority. He earned the authority. Remember, he gave it up when he came to earth. Now he earned it. He learned uh, how to live a obedience. He learned obedience according to Hebrews. He went through his passion and he earned the right to receive the authority. And he got it. Now, we have that authority, and then he says, with that, with that authority, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is packed with information. Now, Again, we can see the construction, the, the construction, telling us we have to do with three distinct persons. But there's a chiasm. Now be careful when looking at chiasms because some people scratch out chiasms where you don't even have structure. So that's dangerous. But you can clearly see this chiasm. It says, go therefore into the world with my authority, and a, comp a compliment, knowing I am with you. So you go into the world, you have my authority, and I'm with you always until the end. That was the promise. So go into the world, know I'm with you. That's the first part of the chiasm. Then B, make disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? B, compliment, teach them. So you make disciples. You teach them to keep everything that I've told you to do. And if you've completed that, then baptize them. And that is why we read in the Didache 
first teach them all things because they saw this and they interpreted it in this way. Shows you that is the crux of the matter. See, the pinnacle of the chiasm. A chiasm is a poetic structure that they used in Hebrew writings. It's the pinnacle. Now they want to take out that which it's all about. It's the baptism. It works up to the baptism. It just doesn't make sense structurally to take it out. Okay. It should, it should also teach us that we must be very careful before we baptize people. We must be thorough, like the early church was. Don't just baptize people. First teach them. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, as far as the manuscripts are concerned, there are no known ancient manuscripts of Matthew which contain the ending of Matthew but lack this final episode or that contain it without the Trinitarian formula. There's just no manuscript. So if you have no manuscript telling you that it should be taken out, it's only conjecture, as we saw, that gives you the right to take out this verse from the Bible. It belongs in the Bible, as certainly as I stand here. We've seen the ancient testimonies to that. It belongs in the Bible. So, the manuscript evidence is 100% unanimously in, in agreement on the ending of Matthew and on the Trinitarian formula. Luke Wayne, his calm article, very good article, 2018, a very recent article. Now, this was an absolute wonderful fact that I came across. Now that is the Hindiatris, or the two chi configuration. Chi is the word for and in Greek. And the Greeks used these two words, and, and, to structure sentences. Now it's used, for what is this two chi construction used? It'll become clearer as we go on. It is used to join sentences, prepositional phrases, nouns, verbs, relative clauses, adjectives, and adverbs. Items drawn together in a Tukai configuration, now this is very important, are equal in significance. Or as Bulinga says, says, raised to equal importance. And purposefully ordered, Edward A. Robinson. I only got a hold of a part of his dissertation. He did his dissertation on the Tukai construction. And it's amazing what he found. Now let me show you, first in the Greek, I know many of you cannot re read Greek, but you'll see how it works. We have here two words, kai, kai. They, there are the two words. And the first word before it is patros, which means father. Onuma to patros, in the name of the father. And, this is the first and, now it's, it's connecting this, the next sentence. To huyo and the son, huyo is son. Kai to hagio pneumatos. This guy connects hagio pneumatos, that is the Holy Spirit. So here you have the three names, the, uh, the three persons, the, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the one thing that connects them is onuma, name. Hindraitris also means three through one. So one element that connects all three, that's the name, connects the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There you can see the English Father is connected to the Son, is connected to the Holy Spirit. Now remember, they are equal in importance. They're equal in importance. That shows you that the Father and in stature, the Father 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they're on equal footing. Why? Well, they have one name connecting them. And we'll see what, which name that is. One name connecting them. That shows you that we have three persons, but one God, one name. And as we continue, it will become clearer. Now, we also read, the Lord is the Spirit. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17. Let's have a look. Verse 14, the Lord, or Kurios, referred to, to Christ in verse 14. Now here in verse 16, the Lord doesn't refer to Christ. He says in verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And Jesus called his father, father also Kurios. So the Lord is Kurios, that's the Spirit. But Kurios is Jesus, as we know. And Kurios also refers to the Father. Mark 13 verse 20. So the one name that binds them together is the word Kurios or Yahweh, the most holy name, the tetragrammaton, that was not, to be, not supposed to be pronounced. That's this one name, this most holy name, connects these three persons in one Godhead. Philip said to him, Lord, uh, I must just first say, this is the fullness principle. We find it in Colossians 2, verse 9 to 10, and Colossians 1, verse 19 to 22. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. John 14, verse 8. Jesus was and is enough. <laughs> he was the Father in his fullness. He was therefore the Father himself in person, in the person of Jesus. That's why it says, I am. You looked at me, and I'm so long with you. I've been with you so long. How can you ask me, show us the Father? He is the same God. So if you see me, you've seen the Father. The fullness principle. Jesus' promise was, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. John 14 verse 16. Now, Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of the age. And I will be with you in my fullness. The same principle. Jesus was, the, was God in his fullness on earth, manifested. He was God with us. The Holy Spirit is God in his fullness in us. Jesus, God with us. The Holy Spirit, God in us. But in his fullness. That's why Jesus said, it is, it is good for you that I go. It's beneficial. And Jesus also promised, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God will be with us in full strength until the end. Now we ask the same question as Philip, oh Lord, please show us that you are present with us. When I was younger and I went through difficult times, I many times asked God, I just want to see you. I just want to know you are there. Please show you. You show yourself. Maybe you've had that struggle as well. So we ask the same question, oh Lord, please show us that you are present with us and that will be enough. And he answers, I, the Holy Spirit, is enough. He's enough. Why? Because he's God in his fullness. And you must know that just a presence or a power will not cut it. Because the principle is only God himself can contain God in his fullness. Only God himself can contain God in his fullness. The spirit would not have been enough if he was not God himself. How would he contain the fullness? How would he be enough for us? How would he be the one to be with us until the conclusion of the, the history of this world? If he was not God, because he would not be able to contain God. And there's another problem. The teaching that God is present in, a, in an 
animate thi- inanimate thing, like just a presence, is pantheism. We are teaching pantheism by doing that, by taking away the personhood of the Holy Spirit. We are teaching pantheism. We read, the Father is Lord, Kurios or Yahweh, Mark 13, 20. Jesus is Lord, Kurios Yahweh, Colossians 1, verse 15 to 18. And the Spirit is Lord, Kurios Yahweh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. One name for all three persons of the Godhead. The fullness of God in all three persons. It is particularly important that we realize that the Holy Spirit is a godly person. Just as Jesus and the Father. Otherwise, God could not be present in his fullness in the Spirit. Otherwise, we have pantheism. In the name, one name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That one name is Yahweh, as you saw. Now, very interesting. Again, a little bit of Greek. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 6. Here we have the Shema. We spoke about the Shema in the first lecture. That was the central article of faith of the Jews and also of the Christians in a Christianized way, as I've shown in the first lecture. Now, here the Shema is coupled with a two-kai construction. And I want you to have a look here. Verse 4 Yes, pneuma, that is spirit. It is connected by the and, the kai, to kurios, the Lord. It is connected by and, verse 6, with God, or theos. So this is very powerful. Here we have the two kai construction that comes from Matthew, that we saw in Matthew 28, verse 19. And we have the shema. The restatement of the Shema, including the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead. Very powerful. Here is the English. And there are the two ands. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same or one Spirit. It is this one Spirit that I've, that's my commentary that I added into it. It's the one Spirit that decides who gets which gift. And then five And there are a variety of ministries and the same one Lord. It is the Lord Jesus who calls us to our different ministries. And there are varieties of of effects, but the same God, one God. So the same God, the same God, the same God, one God, one God, one God. And that it is the Father who draws us to Christ. That's how he is all in all. The Father draws us to Christ, John 6, 44, through the Holy Spirit, so that we can be made perfect in Him and go to the Father through Him, where the Holy Spirit again intercedes for us, who works all things in all persons. Can you see how He is all in all? God the Holy Spirit, all in all. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us to the Father. The Father gave His Son his son, John 3.16, and he draws us to him, John 6.44. Jesus paid the price so that we can be made perfect in him, not by my will be done, but yours. And the Holy Spirit, we are changed and we grow in Christ through the Holy Spirit, all in all. Now, again, we have a restatement of the Shema in 1 Peter 1, verse 1 to 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. That's a restatement of the Shema again. And all three persons are drawn into. And it's interesting. The Spirit is in the middle and is flanked by the Father and Christ. There's much more to this verse. 
but we don't have time to go into detail. Then, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, again, is the Shema and the Hindiatris. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So there's the Hindiatris or the Tukai construction again, and we have a re the restatement of the Shema together. Then, Ephesians 4, verse 4 to 6. I hope you see that these are all the verses that are used by uh, anti-Trinitarians to negate the Trinity. And in fact, they actually support the Trinity. They support the Godhead in three persons. Let me rather put it that way. They support the Godhead in three persons, very clearly. Again, we have here in Ephesians 4 verse 4, we have the Tukai construction. Verse 5 is and, and it connects the, the Spirit. It starts with the Spirit. It's connected by first, and you don't see it in the translation, but it's there in the original. And one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We only have one hope because we were called by the Lord Jesus Christ and answered through faith by becoming one with him through baptism. So all of that is one idea, one statement. Then it's connected, verse 6, and... Again, not in the translation, but in the original. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The Father so loved us that he gave us the Son, our Lord and Savior to make us perfect in him through the work of the Holy Spirit. Through all and in all. Restatement of the Shema and the Tukai construction, including the Holy Spirit in the Godhead. Now, what does Ellen White say? Christ determined that when he ascended from this earth, he would bestow a gift on those who had believed on him. And those who should believe on him, what gift could he bestow rich enough to signalize and grace his ascension to the meditorial throne? It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty he determined to give his representative the third person of the Godhead. Why would she say the third person if there is no third person? And I've read the commentaries, I've listened to the presentations of anti-Trinitarians on this specific quote, and man, I cannot tell you how the text is twisted to try and say what they, their preconceived ideas are telling them. It's plainly stated, there's a third person of the Godhead. This gift could not be excelled. He would give all gifts in one, and therefore, the divine spirit. The fullness of the Godhead, in other words. That converting, enlightening, and sanctifying power would be his donation. That is such an... Good quotation. Then she says, the work of salvation is not a small matter, but so vast that the highest authorities are taken hold of by the expressed faith of the human agent. The eternal Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is involved in the action required to make assurance to the human agent. Very, very, very clear. Then she says, the Holy Spirit is the comforter in Christ's name. He personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. How clear can you be? We may have the Holy Spirit if we ask for it and make it a habit to turn to and trust in God rather than in any finite human agent. So if the Holy Spirit is not a finite agent, he means he's an infinite agent. And there's only one infinite agent, and that is God himself. We need to realize, this is uh, 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 manuscript 66, 
1899. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. She said this when she, was, she did a talk in Australia, in our university there, Avondale College. Now, if the Holy Spirit is not a person, in the same answer, the same breath, you must say God is not a person because she says just as much as God is a person. God the Father is a person. That's what she means. She doesn't say it, but that's what she means. He's a person. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit. Now, this is important. In all the fullness of the Godhead, make King manifests the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these, so she says it must be baptized in these three names. And these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in the efforts to live the new life in Christ. Just to go to retrace our steps a little bit. When we spoke about the, uh, the, the, the youngest document that we have, the Didache, the first two quotations has, have, you know, they are the full quotations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But as it progresses later, it doesn't use the full quotation. It doesn't say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It summarizes. And the summary statement is in the name of Jesus. That's a summary statement. It doesn't mean that we cannot baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It just means as he refers to that baptism, he refers to it as in Jesus' name. That should make you think. It's only one name. And if you baptize in the name of Jesus, you baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, we have read the first statements that she said about God the Father. She said, He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but we cannot see them him with mortal eyes. She said that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead manifested, we know, in the flesh. Now she says about the Spirit, that the Spirit, when He presents Himself, He presents Him in all the fullness of the Godhead. What does that mean? Why does she change the words like that? Well, very interesting. The Spirit, other than the Father and the Son, represents all of the Godhead. So he presents himself in all the fullness of the Godhead. And she says also, in another in manuscript releases, volume 2, she says, evil has been accumulating for centuries and could only be restrained and resisted by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in fullness of divine power. He is there, he presents the Father, he represents the Father in his fullness. He represents Jesus Christ in his fullness. And he can only do that if he is God himself. Nothing else can contain God but God himself. And he, he is the representative. He he is the representative. He contains both and he represents both Jesus and his Father in the fullness of divine power. Then, this is the true test, the doing of the words of Christ. And it is the evidence of the human agent's love to Jesus. And he that doeth his will giveth to the world the practical evidence of the fruit he manifests in obedience, in purity and in holiness of character. If a man love me, 
He will keep my words and my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, she says, we, this, this is her comment on John 15, 23. We, that is the father and the son and the Holy Ghost will come and make our abode in the believer, in him or her. I've heard uh, some of our discussions in some of our discussions that you say you said that he only represents the father and the son he doesn't represent himself but she clearly states that the father the son and the holy ghost will make their abode in the believer so he presents himself in the fullness of the godhead the fullness of the father and the son and his own fullness he represents and in us. That's why we have that change in, in wording, is to express this wonderful fact. And it's so powerful. Just think about it. We have the fullness of the God it, in his fullness of divine power at our disposal to live our lives. How can we not resist temptation if we have this? It's wonderful. That's why through the Holy Spirit all three abides in us. It is the fullness of the divine power. Okay. She also says in uh, Desire of Ages 671, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as three distinct agencies. Sometimes she uses the word persons. Sometimes she uses the word personalities. Sometimes she uses the word agencies, as you see here. Sometimes she uses the word powers. It doesn't matter. She's not hung up on, on uh, philosophical wording. That's not important. But the idea is there. Three powers, three agencies, three persons, three personalities, one God. In other words, we are filled up to the fullness of God in Christ and through the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. That's wonderful. Again, please reconsider your position. If you turn your back on the Holy Ghost, on the Holy Spirit, you are making it in impossible for God to reach your heart. It's very difficult to hear his voice if you do not acknowledge him. And if you worship, if you worship a false God, how are you going to be led by his spirit? That's impossible. I implore you Reconsider your position. Listen to what I've said in these three presentations and come back to God's church. Let's pray together. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank thee for the wonderful, wonderful message of your Son and your Spirit and that you are present in our present day in your fullness through your Spirit. Take captive our hearts and our minds and lead us in your footsteps. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.